Thank you for your uh, So, yeah, so just a little intro. Um, I'm Sam. I hail from San Francisco and Chicago. Uh, right now, I'm working at a company called Brown that is building a new type of mobile database. Uh, cool stuff. But what I do that I actually enjoy more than my day job is I write a lot of reading. Um, I don't get paid for it. Uh, but I do it anyway, so uh, you might know me from a few open source projects. My head is on GitHub, just like this. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I work at Realm. Um, I'm a core contributor and now apparently a dictator at CocoaBots, um, which is a Cocoa dependency management tool. And recently I've been contributing to Bundler, which I'm sure a fair number of people here use. Um, so uh, I, I, I even have some news about that, but maybe I can get a sneak preview of later. Oh, and no, I'm not texting. I've got a fancy little alert on my phone. Uh, so show a fancier. Who writes Ruby for a living? It's quite a lot more people than, uh, you know, if I had asked that question last night at an iOS meetup. <laughs> <laughs> so, who uses something that's built in Ruby like on a daily basis? And if someone didn't raise their hand, they're probably wrong. Um, so, yeah, we we use a bunch of Ruby stuff every day, whether we're Ruby developers or not. So, uh, you know, we we could name a bunch of projects that that are written in Ruby. Let's you know. Get all the websites out of the way that happen to use Ruby on their back end. But um, if you have a Mac and you've ever used Homebrew, that's Ruby. If you're an iOS developer and you've ever used CocoaPods, that's Ruby. There are like countless projects that you'd never know are Ruby under the hood. But they are. Uh, so that that can lead to yeah. That can lead to, uh, to some interesting results when suddenly those projects are being used by the people who aren't in this room, the, the people who don't write Ruby every day, the, the people who are you know, just normal developers trying to, to get work done. Um, you know, and those are great tools, but their utility isn't limited to just us. Uh, so. Again, the answer is no. Um, you know, I I know a bunch of Cocoa developers who use Cocoa Pods, and they love it until they find out that it's actually like Ruby, and they've been using Ruby all this time, and they're horrified. <laughs> it's kind of fun, uh, and and then it's like, well, you think it's bad now? Let me show you the code. Uh, so, you know, not, not everyone who uses the stuff we build is a Ruby developer. Uh, but sometimes it's really hard for us to get into that mindset of what is it like to not know the stuff that we take for granted every day. So the, the stuff I'm going to be talking about tonight are kind of the lessons that I've learned mostly from working on CocoaPods of, uh, you know, exposing a bunch of Cocoa developers who think that they hate Ruby to Ruby and how to make them, you know, hate it a bit less, <laughs> I suppose. So I write Ruby every day, um, or almost every day. So therefore, I'm a Rubyist. But I'm really not. I get paid as an iOS developer. I'm a student, I'm a bunch of other things, but I am a Rubyist. And it's really hard sometimes to forget what that entails. So when I talk about, you know, to, to someone who's maybe using a Ruby DSL, well, why don't you just, you know, do this six method, long method chain? That, you know, I, I have them lost at the, wait, there's a dot map, open paren, ampersand, colon, what? <laughs> um, and, you know, that, it's fun and I get to explain the, the crazy Ruby syntax. Um, but to me, that's normal. And to most of us, probably, that's something we see every day. And we're like, yeah, I know what that's doing. Um, 
So let's take a look at some of the, the tools that we use. Uh, number one are version, Ruby version managers, uh, especially if you write tools other people use, you know that you know there are a bunch of Ruby versions and like until recently I had to support Ruby, what was it, 1.8.7. Fun times, like, you shaking your head. Um, yeah, that, that was a thing that that was happening until a couple months ago. Um, Bumbler, like not only do I use it now, I really code for it. Uh, and just a, a random thing I'll put in there that, that can really be a pain are native extensions. Um, so, yeah, version managers. They're great when you want to have multiple Rubies involved, uh, installed and you know, different versions, and maybe you don't like the system version because Apple's still providing Ruby 2.0.0. They could update that. Uh, so, you know, for me, I've got a bunch of Ruby versions installed. Um, if we look at my other machine that has a bunch of 187 and 193 versions, it's probably goes closer to 20. Um, you know, for other people, they use like their, their OS 10 system Ruby, and uh, you know, be thankful it's not 187 anymore. So, like w one thing I, I often see in, in GitHub issues is like, can't you just update your Ruby version? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a really helpful response. Uh, you know, go ahead and just copy and paste these six commands into the terminal, none of which you understand, and I promise you I'm not compromising your system. <laughs> uh, so, bundler. It's wonderful. I love it. But most people just want to install a tool once and forget about it. They want to say, okay, here's, like, I use CocoaPods. I just want CocoaPods to be available on my machine. Um, and I probably want the latest version of it. And I just want it to work, and I don't want it to break when I update my operating system or when it open up, you know, when I do, you know, brew update, open SSL, you know, any of those things. They, they, want, people, they want their tools to work. You know, I, I always tell iOS developers, like, just throw a, you know, you, you have Ruby dependencies, throw a gem file on the Ruby project. Um, there are just daggers of hate in my direction when I suggest that. Um, so it's like, yeah, you should use a gem file, you should version your dependencies, you should, you know, declaratively say what they are, explicit is better than implicit in this case. Um, those aren't winning arguments to have with people. Um, so your gem is going to be installed as like a you know system wide and you know some people won't figure out that they need sudo to install even though the you know, error message will say it um, so you'll get a bunch of support tickets about that and then God forbid you monkey patch system stuff and um, then there are conflicts and you just get a, a headache and it it's really easy to say these are problems that we as the Ruby community have, answer, uh, have you know, found solutions for because we have. But that's not really a, an empathetic response to your users. Um, so the, the, the last um, complaint I have about us as a community are native extensions. Uh, we had one of these in CocoaPods for the longest time. It was a nightmare. So they, they're just honestly a pain uh, trying to deal with them and you get across OS versions and updates and uh, different Ruby versions. And so this is when we got rid of our uh, native extension in CocoaPods. This was how we blogged about it. <laughs> uh, long live precompiled gems. Uh, we actually, like six updates later, got rid of our native extension entirely and our doing uh, evil things with using fiddle DL opening some of Xcode's private frameworks to get stuff done, um, which is also terrible. But it's terrible for us and not terrible for our users. And in the end, that's what matters. So, you know, not everyone needs to have a compiler installed. 
or the Ruby headers in the correct place, which OS X is really terrible about, or a proper build setup. Uh, you know, people just want to be able to install something. Um, they, they shouldn't have to have all that stuff set up to be able to use you know, whatever random tool. Uh, so this is when, when I was talking about this talk uh, with Alloy, who's sort of the, the founder of CocoaPods. This was his response. Um, this was taken from him verbatim from a, from a 50 comment long GitHub issue when people were complaining about our GitHub extension. Um, said, you know, in this developer bubble, basically, we've forgotten what normal is. Um, and I know I'm guilty of this all the time both in this sense and, you know, just in general talking to other developers, it's like, well, what do you mean you're not going to use XYZ? You don't have a dependency manager to install your dependency manager to install your dependency manager. Um, yes, I believe that is a thing you need homebrew to install Python and easy install and then easy install to install pip in the Python community, and I think I got the order of that right. <laughs> uh, and you know there are like for me I I use these tools a lot of us use these tools but they're in the end something that we should be able to opt into using and not you know force upon other people okay so now you've just heard me complain about um, you know all the ways that Ruby can be utterly terrible and oh no uh, it's not supposed to happen. <laughs> I'm done by the fancy remote. Yeah, this is your remote. Want to talk about providing an easy to use experience? Okay, there we go. Did it work? Yes. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> okay, so from from like that was 15 minutes of complaining I just did, um, but I as much as I love being a pessimist and a downer, um, there is a reason I spend like you know hours into the night writing Ruby. Uh, you can do a lot of really fun stuff with it, and I think applied correctly, you can make people who think they hate Ruby not hate it, um, as long as they don't know that they're using Ruby. Okay, so yeah, let's let's get positive, um, because I'm, I'm not here to tell all of y'all that you're doing things wrong. Um, it was just like some general stuff to, to think about, but now I want to say, okay, so this is the stuff to avoid, what, what can I actually, you know, actively do to make things better? So I'm going to focus on building DSLs, because DSLs are really useful in general purpose <laughs> tools. And uh, that's what I have experience doing. So yeah, Ruby is awesome for building DSLs. Um, there are a bunch of tools in Ruby that aren't in most languages uh, that let you build DSLs that stop looking like code but you also have the power of a turn complete interpreter at your hands. Um, so, does anyone know what where this code snippet might be coming from? Pod file? Yes, it is a pod file. Um, so this is how, if you use CocoaPods, you'll, you will uh, specify your dependencies. Uh, you may also notice that while this is valid Ruby, it doesn't really have to look like a bunch of code. Uh, it looks like a config file, vaguely. Uh, you know, you don't have parentheses everywhere. You don't have string syntax characters. Um, you do have that, you know, do end thing, but we'll, you know, we'll, for, we'll forgive the language a little bit. If we wanted significant white space, we'd be quite off. 
So yeah, it barely even looks like a. And then there's this. Uh, and did I? I think I even spelled specification correctly. This is the other DS, Ruby DSL that CocoaPod ships with, and it looks a bit different. Um, here we see uh, double colons and you know dot syntax and uh, you know pipe characters and assignment operators. This this is starting to look a bit more like code. And while that may be fine for us, it is a bit more scary. Uh, you're starting to, to think about, uh, you know, what do I need to know about syntax? And instead of just, okay, I know a couple of keywords and therefore I understand this domain specific language. Um, you know, with with a DSL like this, you really do need to know the entire Ruby language instead of your own DSL. So, that being into the code there, there's pretty much one difference. Um, and that is Ruby's evil versus Ruby's evil. Um, we have you know, using instance eval versus normal eval. Um, show him. You know, show of hands, who thinks I prefer the first one? Me? I do. <laughs> Crazier stuff that's not available in other languages? Count me in. Um, but seriously, if someone doesn't realize that they're writing Ruby, good job. Because now you're letting people focus on doing whatever it is they want to be doing instead of Oh wow, I hate Ruby. Which I, at, at my last job, I seriously just heard an iOS developer saying, like, I want everything to be JSON. Um, have fun with that. You can copy and paste and, you know, everything a hundred times over. Um, so just, you know, writing a DSL, what do I think is good and bad? Um, liberal use of emoji here because I like emoji. Uh, don't put emoji in your DSL. I've seen a few developers try and do this now with Swift and their emoji operators. Please don't. <laughs> Not cool. Um, so what do I like? Uh, Ruby 1.9 hash syntax is awesome because it looks less like <coughs> crazy syntax and a bit more like, okay, key, value, key, value, key, value, which is familiar. Um, curly brace for and lambdas. Curly <laughs> braces are scary. Uh, <laughs> uh, unless you write Python, in which case you miss them a lot. Uh, the Python hate is unintentional, but I'm not apologizing. <laughs> um, do and blocks are pretty good because they're English. Um, symbol parameters, nah, because do you really want to explain to someone what symbols are and how they work and how a symbol is different from a string, even though it looks like a string and it really is a string? <laughs> no. Um, and then the last one is, is kind of cryptic. Uh, so what I'm saying is, is really good here is if you're going to like, declare functions and stuff in your DSL, just take whatever arguments and do your own validation. Don't rely on the interpreter saying, oh, wrong number of parameters here, because you're going to spit out a really long stack trace, and it's going to remind everyone that, oh, wait, they're actually writing Ruby. Uh, so yeah, I, I say, you know, hide the, hide the Ruby app back. Um, so this is copy and pasted from an actual CocoaPods GitHub issue. Question, if you're in the back, can you read that? No. Yeah, I can't read that. <laughs> if you're in the front. Exactly. So, you, you know, if this showed up in your terminal, would you be really happy to see it? Probably not. Can you get it to fit across the screen if you have something smaller than a 13-inch screen? <laughs> Probably not. That's... Oh, wait, you don't, you don't like your stack traces to be, you know, 
<laughs> a hard draft at 80 characters. <laughs> um, so we could replace that exact screen with that. Um, a, it wraps nicely, and B, you can probably read that like further than 10 inches away. Uh, and C, if you don't know what's in the project's guts, this is going to give you a lot better chance of fixing whatever's wrong. Um, so I have actually yet to make this change in CocoaPods because I'm lazy. And I chose to fix other bugs today uh, because they were more fun. Uh, yes, bugs are fun. Um, but like, just seriously, helpful error messages go a really long way towards making your users happy and your software seem friendly. Um, not just you know in the context of building tools, but honestly, whatever software you're writing, or even if it's not software, um, don't spew out human backtraces. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, just in general, be be friendly to your users. Uh, I don't think there's anything special you need to you need to do to, to build awesome Ruby stuff. It's just the general be empathetic and think in terms of how is your user going to experience whatever it is you've built. Um, is it going to seem like something impregnable to them where they're, you know, climbing a thousand flights of stairs to just try and, you know, get to some small bit of functionality? Or is it a tool that they're really happy to turn to when it's needed and it does its job really well and doesn't get in the way and doesn't provide frustration? Um, so honestly, I think like ninety percent of the complaints I hear from developers come from frustration. It's not good or bad or you know fast or slow or buggy or stable. It's it, it all just comes down to like has this software been respectful to me? Has it been friendly to me? Um, someone's got a message. <laughs> oh, I turned it off. <laughs> um, so yeah, sure these particular tips that I've just run through are designed to keep Ruby newcomers happy. But you know what? I guarantee you, if you follow them, it'll make your software much friendlier. And it'll make all your Ruby users happier. And as a maintainer of a project, it will make you a lot happier. Um, when maybe your users can start to debug their own issues and instead of you know posting a bunch of back traces on GitHub issues, because those are a lot of fun to go through. <laughs> Even better are the redacted backtraces where the wrong parts have been redacted. <laughs> that, that seriously happens all the time. Um, so yeah, you know, these, these are just a, a bunch of tips. Um, you know, writing good, empathetic, friendly, usable software in Ruby or any language is, you know, going to take a lot longer than half an hour to, to talk about. You know, it's something that I've spent years and years trying to do, and I know I'm still terrible at it, and I'm still trying to get better. But I think they make a, a really good first step, and you get a lot of bang for your buck just by you know following these small things and just thinking about you know for for all the things I've talked about, just try and think. What could have been the frustrated user who caused me to say this was a bad way to implement something? There's got to be something better, something that will make them happier and make me happier. Um, and yeah, so these slides are available on Speaker Deck. And uh, God, I, I hope I spelled all this right. So, much, so the next slide before I before I go to it. Um, I had one snippet of Swift code last night, and as a showing of how much Ruby I'd written earlier in the day, I was missing the uh, showing parens on the last method call, and I blame Ruby for that. <laughs> so, that said. <laughs> Seriously, questions? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you 
Cocoa yeah. programmer? Why do Cocoa programmers dislike Ruby when it's all just message passing? So the question is, why do you know so many Cocoa programmers dislike Ruby even though it's all small talk style message passing <coughs> under the hood? Um, quite honestly, I don't know. I fall into the camp of obviously I fall into the camp of people who love both. Um, but honestly, I I think for the most part, there's especially with CocoaPods, there's this idea of well, this is a tool towards Cocoa developers should be written in Objective C. But no, Objective C would be a crazy language to write command line tooling in. Um, you know, we're you know all of us CocoaPods contributors are really happy it's Ruby. Uh, but yeah, I, I think for the most part, it's just sort of fear of the unknown. It's I'm not used to Ruby, and here it is in this one tiny corner of my world, and it's sort of upsetting the balance where everything else is the language I like. Um, and again, I think mostly it comes up when it's like, you know, things go wrong, or there are bugs, or someone wants to contribute a patch, and they feel a huge amount of frustration that things are unfamiliar. Do you really want to hear all the questions before you answer them? <laughs> so the, the question was, do I really want to hear all the questions before answering them? And uh, you ask an obnoxious question, I'm going to give an obnoxious answer. All return something that's lazy. Happy? <laughs> Hands. Another question. Did you say you were going to say something about Bundler? Exciting things that are going to happen? Yeah, oh, yeah. she wasn't done. I think I did. So I've got the the right version installed. Uh, actually, what directory am I in? And this is on Tor directory. So this is just a, a regular Ruby script I'm starting. Um, can you bump your font size? Yeah, can you move it again? Is that any better? Is it even getting better? It's chromulent. It's chromulent. Is that sufficient? It's a perfectly chromulent size. <laughs> So uh, I'd like to point out that right now if I run pod version, I've got an RC installed. Woo! Um, I would say I'm living on the edge, but I'm the one who released the RC, so it's already old news. Um, but now if I, if I run... Oh, okay. <laughs> if, so, the, the dangers of like live coding. So, I bet you've never seen that done, require bundler, bundler slash inline. Well, you haven't, I just added that file last week. Wait, what? Different versions? But I don't have a gem file in here or anything. Um, well, if we look back here, that's an inline gem file. There's no gem file required in the directory. Uh, sets up bundler like normal, doesn't spew out any files anywhere. Uh, so someone made a, a feature request maybe about a week ago. And ironically enough, when I was working on this talk, uh, I kind of got bored with it and wanted to write some code. So I looked on the, the bundler issues and I saw this feature request. I'm like, hmm. 
I bet that would be pretty easy if you used a temporary directory somewhere. So I did that. And then uh, I was like, well, no, but this requires a string here. And I kind of like the block just because syntax highlighting is a beautiful thing and I don't ever want to give it up. Uh, so like 13 lines of code later, you can do this. Um, so now the reason I'm showing all of you this, I want you all to pressure Andre Arco to merge this pull request <laughs> and not revert it before a release um, because I think it's really cool. So. What's your pod version on the command line now? Well, that's unchanged. Just like using Bundle or just like using a normal gem file. If you're interested in the code, it's actually, you know what, it's just one file. Um, <coughs> it's, uh, you know, want to talk about the sort of things you can only really do in Ruby. Um, this is kind of it. But it's yeah, 20 lines of code. This is me trying to like not put everything on one line. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, yeah, this is pretty cool. But also the phone more guys obviously did a did a great job that I could you know come in and build a feature like that without too much hackery. So, yeah, just wanted to to show off the the most recent crazy thing I've done in Ruby. So the, the question was, when, when building a DSL, what versions of Ruby do I try and support? Um, right now, and this is the CocoaBots answer, uh, 2.0. Seems reasonable to me. Um, what? Didn't they just kill 193? Did I see that? I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 193 reached end of life last month. Yeah. Okay, nice. so 193 breached end of life, which means there are probably only still a bunch of people using it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, 2.0, um, it, it's kind of what I've wanted to target for the past year and a half or so. Um, and then CocoaPods land, we finally moved over to that just because we could, uh, it was the a system version, you know, our minimum OS 10 target had finally gotten high enough that it shipped with 2.0 instead of 187. Um, which, that was a day of celebration when we did, we, we just deleted a whole bunch of code. Um, so, yeah. Uh, if I were building something now, I'd say it would require 2.2, but that's just because it's what I'm using right now. Uh, and. I don't like supporting old things at the start of a project because you wait two years to break uh, backwards compatibility and then you're supporting something really old. It seems like those are all the questions. Speak now or wait until after this is all done asking more. Thank <laughs> you.